Every language is a system, all of whose parts interrelate and interact organically. Georg von der Gabelitz. Welcome to this week's episode of Warfare, Advancement, and Revisionism. My name is Preston Floyd, and as always, I'm your host. I'd like to thank everyone for joining me this week, um, especially uh, all our new listeners, and there does seem to be quite a few. Uh, I hope uh, you're joining us uh, in the newer episodes and they're going back and listening, but uh, May is off to a scorching start. Um, I think it's very easily going to break uh, my total downloads in a month. Um, we're already halfway there uh, with only uh, about, um, well, only one real episode put out and we still got a couple of more left. So uh, thank you for your support. And if you're uh, listening on any platform, please rate, subscribe, all that kind of good stuff. Um, so, uh, let's go ahead and get into it, and again, I appreciate everyone's support, new li- listeners, uh, old listeners, all you guys, thank you, thank you, thank you. So, um, this week we will be finishing up our coverage of West Africa for the season, and this will be a shorter episode, uh, to cap a short section of the season. I know that might be frustrating to some, um... But because of the Saharan desiccation that's happening, uh, it's hard to find a lot of firm archaeological materials. And we're having to make more guesses and suppositions. But starting next season, we will have more firm information to go into. And of course, there's always the chance um, you know, new uh, discoveries will be made. Um, We'll be talking about one of the more recent discoveries that happened, uh, at least one of the sites. And I know I've mentioned it before. I believe I mentioned it last season. We were talking about uh, West Africa. Um, So, who knows? We may find something like that um, uh, later. Uh, So, um... But uh, that said, it's important to remember that the peoples of West Africa, and indeed people everywhere, uh, generally have more technology than what their artifacts indicate. Uh, And even in a situation where you can't find any artifacts, you know that obviously uh, they're homo sapiens, they're very creative and intelligent, Um, they have, of course, very long experience living in the area, so they, they know in general how to survive. They, of course, know what they need to live and uh, how to get it. They just need to find the sources and develop them. Now, um, we talked about last season how it is very likely that uh, West Africans or their ancestors living in the Sahara had independently developed pottery. Uh, They were also probably well on their way to domesticating plants and possibly some animals as well, much like the peoples in the Middle East and East Asia. However, as the Sahara was beginning to dry, uh, these people were probably hampered uh, in the development of uh, these advancements and their spread. Um, They're, of course, too useful to be forgotten or abandoned, but the region was becoming less and less conducive for experimentation and innovation um, and just probably for large-scale planting uh, when it comes to agriculture. Um, This is why I believe that the peoples who are spreading into West Africa uh, see a delay in them finalizing their adoption, I guess if you want to call it that. It's obviously not a formal adoption, but uh, they aren't able to sit uh, to stay sedentary uh, and begin to practice true agriculture yet. They're still at that kind of mix of you know, rough horticulture and proto-agriculture. Uh, and of course they're um, because they can't stay in any one place for too, too long um, this is preventing them from making more varied um Pottery and ceramics are probably just using very simple, easy-to-carry designs. Uh, and, of course, generally as you know, people are in one place longer and they, um, you know, uh, have more and more free time that 
agriculture helps to provide, um, they begin to change up how they create pottery, and both in terms of um, uh, shapes of vessels and uh, what the what the and they may not even be making vessels at that point. They could be making uh, certain types of ornamentation or statues or little votive figures or whatever. Uh, so um, art isn't developing as much uh, in much the same way as just uh, I guess practical application. They've just been practicing their known traditional forms of art. Um, <clears throat> However, uh, there is one craft that they're continuing to hone and develop, uh, even as the ever-expanding desert and drier and drier environment uh, causes them to search farther and wider for uh, more welcoming and supportive lands, uh, that being um, a textile, cloth, or leather production, what, whatever you want to call it. Um, now, West Africa is going to become a major axis of this type of activity with every sizable group, and even in some cases, smaller groups, uh, eventually developing their own styles where they specialize in uh, their own favorite materials, uh, their process of refining those materials, uh, and colors as well. And in some cases, people in the same ethnic groups end up having wildly different dress and their cousins. Excuse me. Now, um, I need to be clear, national and ethnic costumes are not uniquely West African. Uh, but in terms of population density, uh, the region sees much more dynamic differences as opposed to, say, um, you know, someone living in Germany and someone living in France. Uh, obviously, they're you know, seasonal differences that you got to take into account, but by and large, most European clothes, generally, there's periods where certain styles are more popular than others, even if they're not made by the same people, they are at least trying to copy um, neighbors. And that's same is true in um, East Asia as well. Um, and whereas in West Africa, uh, it seems, and this may be me projecting a little, but it seems like um, all these people have a little bit more, um, I guess, pride in their national dress or their ethnic dress. Now, part of that is because um, whereas Europe and East Asia develop, you know, I guess you'd call them more industrial type um, production methods. And again, that's just, that's probably not a very accurate word. Uh, whereas West Africa, it's something that's done more in a smaller uh, home or maybe village setting where it's someone, you know, it's a group of people who are practicing traditions that have been passed on to them, so they take pride in those pr traditions, whereas um, that's maybe not the case in certain um, certain other places in the world. Now, uh, I will say it is hard to say when this development happens for sure. But I think as proto-agriculture is becoming more important again this season, which is towards the end, um, and peoples are moving into and through uh, West Africa, and they're encountering more varied client, uh, or climates, um, they're, they're probably developing more varied dress and accessories. Um, you know, they may not, they may not having changing their clothes too much, but they may be making cloaks or uh, different types of shoes or hats or things like that. Uh, so that's important to take into account as well. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, going back to a little bit of our discussion uh, last week about um, uh, the, the languages in the uh, Niger-Congo family, um, I want to turn to a few of the smaller languages um, in that family. Now, of course, uh, last episode I talked about the, uh, the Mande languages uh, and how they kind of uh, looks like, it appears at least, that they were made possibly pushed south by the desification of the Sahara, and they kind of split um, 
more widely accepted, or at least accepted is not the right word. Uh, they kind of split more uh, more branches of the Niger Congo family that show more explicit similarities. I think that might be the best way that these that the languages that split are more firmly rooted together as being part of the Niger Congo. Monde, of course, being a little bit unique uh, among. Uh, or I should say the Monde family, having a little bit more uniqueness to it than the other Niger-Congo languages. And of course, again, we've talked about it, um, that there is some debate as to whether or not it should be included at all, but we're not going to go into that anymore because by and large it is, in most people's estimation, included. Um, <clears throat> now, of course, uh, I talked about how it was definitely a language at this point, uh, Niger Congo, I mean, uh, and it it had probably begun to split as the spread of agriculture uh, begins to take root. Uh, different regions will develop, uh, of course, their own crops, their own methods for growing these crops. So that's where you begin to see uh, more diversification uh, in the languages, which of course gives rise to different uh, branches of the family. Uh, now you have the Atlantic portion of the Atlantic Congo, which is the biggest uh, sub family of the Niger Congo family. Um, the Atlantic languages are almost all along the, of course, the Atlantic coast um, of uh, West Africa. Uh, and then, of course, you have the Monde that kind of separate the Atlantic languages for the most part uh, from the other parts of the Atlantic Congo family. Um, now, uh, we'll talk about some of those other branches next season because they're more likely to have um, developed by that point. Um, but there are a couple of smaller potential branches that are included in Niger Congo, or at least most of the scholars from what I've read will include at least one or two of these um, languages, if not all of them. Or they may kind of rearrange them uh, in terms of where they would be in the tree. Um, or again, debate whether they belong on the tree at all. Um, but one of those, uh, I guess, subfamilies is the um, Ijaw languages or the Ijo languages. Um, and this is um, one of those that is a little controversial. Uh, I think some of the more recent classifications or some of the more recent linguists lurk working with this um, group uh, are less um, prosaic, maybe is the right word, about the inclusion of the family in the Niger Congo tree. Um, but I know Joseph Greenberg, who I believe I talked about last season. I know I've mentioned him before. Uh, he's, uh, of course, one of the more influential um, linguists in the last uh, at the last half of the 20th century. Um, he thought that Izan did belong in the Niger Congo family, but that it was a very old branch and it probably broke off very early. Um, now, of course, uh, the other people talking about the language think that they could have just been uh, a neighbor, or they're, I guess the proto Izon language speakers were neighbors of the um, proto Niger -Congo, speak, uh, Congo speakers, and that's why they have these very small similarities. Um, but uh, that is, of course, debated. Now, um, these people mostly live in what is now southern Nigeria, so they do not make up by any stretch of the imagination um, a very large ethnic group. Um, but it is possible that they may, again, be uh, one of the uh, first groups to move in. They may have been traveling 
uh, kind of similar routes as Niger Congo speakers. They're the proto Niger Congo speakers. They're moving into the region. If they were not related uh, ethnically or linguistically, um, they may have been moving into the region for the same reasons as the proto Niger Congo speakers. Uh, now, uh, these people's ancestors, or I guess the modern Ijaw people, uh, do have fairly significant population clusters in parts of the Niger River Delta, where it begins to spread out. Um, and they, they, they have some other places, too. They're, I think they have some in places like um, Gabon, Sierra Leone, uh, where they are fishermen which shouldn't be too surprising. Again, they lived in the Niger uh, River Delta. Uh, that's, of course, where the river empties out to the sea. A lot of good uh, fishing in the area, uh, marshes, places like that uh, where they could live. Now, um, the Ijaw, or Aizen, depending on, again, they, um, what, what source you're reading. Um, I think the endonym they use is Aizen. Um, now, I've read a couple of things online. Uh, there are some vastly different dates. Some say that they have lived uh, in, in the Niger Delta region f since before, like, 5000 BC. So, right around the start of this season. Um, now, I could not find any firm sources on that. It's kind of like their own, um, their own story. Um, there's not a lot of archaeology, uh, archaeological evidence, I think, that just confirms that, oh yeah, the people living here at this time are definitely uh, eyes on. Um, but uh, they're definitely related to them. Um, now, how closely is a matter of debate. Uh, I don't think we know for sure, um, you know, that these are eyes on people, um, but they do emerge very early. And because of where they live, they're able to kind of uh, retain their identity and their language uh, a lot more than uh, other groups further inland, um, where they have like these larger, um, more agricultural focused groups kind of move in or expand uh, into other regions. But um, Possibly uh, their people are living in the area at this point in the season. Uh, well, around 5,000 BC, so about 1,000 years after this season starts. That is a possibility, and um, despite the lack of sources, again, their oral history and traditions should have some weight, um, if nothing else. Uh, rivers do factor kind of into their... Uh, traditions. They are very much consider themselves a river people. Um, though some of their uh, claims, or at least I don't know if it's their claims or claims that uh, certain people make about them, um, claim that they immigrated from the Nile Valley during antiquity, which kind of does it make sense if they are one of the more ancient peoples in Nigeria? Which that's kind of a one of the things that you know is debated internally in Nigeria. Who's the oldest group of people in the area? Um, now, it it could be possible that uh, very ancient ancestors uh, of the um, of the Ija moved from southern uh the southern portion of the nile or maybe the lake chad region uh during a period where you know during an even earlier period um if that's the case though they're not part of the nile civilization though uh they may be related to people who were part of the nile valley civilization um i don't think they would have made that long of a trip um, that recently, especially if, as their own traditions state, they have been in the region since around 5,000 years ago. If they were in the Nile Valley or around 
like chat. Uh, it's well before any type of uh, Neolithic or uh, proto-Neolithic um, events are happening, in, in my opinion. Um, but that's not to say they aren't related to some people that were there. Um, very distantly, of course. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of the Ijaw, or the Izo, um, or sorry, Izon, excuse me, Izon. Um, and again, we'll talk about them a little bit more detail next season because it, while I may not be 100% convinced of the 8000 BC, I definitely think that they're there by the end of next season. Um, at least now, whether or not they're referring to themselves as the eyes on at that point, that's a little something we'll dive into. But um, we will talk more about these people uh, next season. Now, the next kind of uh, smaller branch, and yeah, that's not to be pejorative, um, that we should talk about in the Niger Congo family is uh, the Dogon languages. Um, now, uh, there are about 600,000 speakers of Dogon today, uh, and they have like uh, around a dozen to 14 or so um, dialects of Dogon. And they're they're kind of the most, um, I guess you call them kind of the most northerly kind of sub-branch. Uh, and it's not very widespread. Um, they are surrounded kind of on all sides by um, Mande or uh, Atlantic Congo speakers. Um, but they're, uh, they're occupying a region that is... Um, a little harder to get to. It's fairly isolated. And this is kind of like a plateau region of what is now uh, Mali. It's kind of south of um, where the Niger River bends towards the sea. Um, and they have, um, while they may only have like around 600,000 or so speakers, there are maybe as possibly as many as a, a million uh, of these Dogon peoples today, maybe a little bit more. Um, it's hard to say. I think um, now those are older numbers. The only official count I was able to find for them was from ten years or so ago. It could be a lot more today. Um, I don't think the Dogon are experiencing, you know, a lot of um, or at least any more turmoil than any other people in the region. Um, now, these people, um, it's kind of hard to get a firm date on when they're entering where they live now. Uh, their oral traditions do have, um, do claim that they lived alongside the Mande uh, for quite some time. Uh, and eventually they left uh, once uh, the Mande began to persecute them for their religious beliefs. Now, um, this does not happen until, you know, later, well after uh, Islam arrives to the area. So um, they have their own language. Uh, it's a very old language from what we can tell. Uh, it is possibly related to the Mande branch of the Niger Congo, or it could have just been because they were neighbors so long with the Mande and the other uh, parts of the Atlantic uh part of the Niger Congo family they just kind of adopted certain terms and other parts of their their um, their languages um, so they were living somewhere where the Monday lived uh, however uh, where they're going to move now um, or where they live now is very concentrated uh, all the Monday or excuse me all the Dogon peoples are you know fairly uh, compact in in their kind of uh, region, uh, and they're again surrounded on all sides by uh, other you know ethnic and linguistic groups. Um, but um, their language is different from the Mande. Uh, it's different enough that it may not even be Niger Congo. Again, it's debated. So they're very old people. Uh, they were probably living in the area. Uh, at least as long as the Monday were. Um, 
if not maybe a little bit earlier, maybe a, you know, a century or two later, it's hard to say. Um, but uh, they have kept their, uh, their identity intact, their, uh, their own kind of um, culture alive. Um, so yeah, so uh, the Dogon people exist, or at least their ancestors do. Uh, what they called themselves at that point, it's hard to say. Um, I would like to go more into their um, into their religious stuff, but again, a lot of their modern day religion is based off of their story of migration away from the Monde, which doesn't happen until you know the historical period where we have really good records and again after Islam arrives to the area so that's quite a ways but um, we can make some guesses uh, about uh, their early religion they are ancestor worshippers um, part of their uh, migration story involves them um, obtaining the bones of a very uh, venerated ancestor and a hero uh, his name is uh, Lebe now, well, I say part of their migration story is trying to obtain those bones. Um, I'm not going to go again into the details on that story till later, uh, but he is kind of the um, he is the progenitor of their race. Uh, he gave uh, he is the father of the two sons who followed uh, or who um, fathered uh, the the tribes of the Dogon. Uh, so he is the the grandfather essentially of of all the Dogon. Um, now they also have gods that they worship as well. Now those I will mention a little bit more here and now. Um, their creator god is known as uh, Ama. Uh, and this is not, he's not a unique deity to them. There are several uh, West and I think some North African religious traditions where there is a god referred to as Ama. So this could be a very old uh, religion uh, for the region and probably the world as well. Uh, of course, we went into detail on um, uh, Kagan uh, for the San peoples, but uh, this is a Am is a little bit different, a little very different than Kagan. Whereas Kagan's kind of a, a trickster uh, creator, um, Ama is is not. Uh, Ama is a uh, sky god, or at least he's usually considered a sky god. Uh, he is also, uh, while he is referred to as he by most, he is somewhat androgynous or uh, hermaphroditic, uh, depending on the group uh, that's more emphasized at by other peoples than um, by by some people and de-emphasized by others. But he kind of is very involved in biological creation so he in some ways uh has both male and female reproductive powers um but uh again he's a sky god he is the creator of the universe uh at least in um well i'm, I'm pretty sure he's considered the creator in all of the pantheons where he was a part of but uh for the dogon uh they do see him definitively as the creator of the the universe and uh he he essentially created kind of the i guess the unformed universe uh was kind of in an egg uh and it had that egg had like like the seeds and everything that you would need to create um life from um and it's and i say it's it's an egg but uh at least according to the Encyclopedia Britannica uh, entry on the egg uh, it was actually more conical and maybe kind of like a weird quadrangle base uh, with kind of a conical top um, and uh, the the corners of the, the base are of course the, the cardinal directions um, anyway uh, depending on the group of uh, Dogen telling the myth, um, something caused this egg to hatch. Uh, it's not specifically mentioned that um, Ama, you know, tried to make it hatch. It just 
the egg hatched itself maybe, or possibly Ama did plan for it to uh, hatch at an appointed time. It's, it's hard to say for sure. Anyway, when the egg hatched, it kind of spit everything out or kind of flung everything out, and uh, this is um, kind of related to uh, the stars filling the sky, uh, the earth forming, the sun forming, the, the moon forming. Uh, and in fact, um, you know, uh, I think, again, uh, one of the articles I read specifically equated it um, kind of with how um, when you spin a pot, like clay kind of flies off and, you know, as you're like working it, uh, it, it kind of gets uh, flung everywhere. Um, and then the Dogon uh, refer to the sun kind of uh, as being kind of like a clay pot fired at the highest heat possible. Um, now, uh, creating the universe is just his first act. He is also credited with having created uh, life. Um, he, uh, Ama, uh, impregnates the earth uh, like, a, like a male figure at this point, whereas before he, of course, laid an egg like a, a chicken or a female um, fowl of some type. Uh, but at this point, uh, where he's creating uh, life, uh, he is uh, a masculine figure at this point. Um, now, uh, the first creature uh, that was born from the earth uh, was not what Ama had intended or wanted. Uh, this creature is a jackal. Um, and the jackal is kind of seen as a, a an affront to the natural order of the world. And uh, they're kind of creatures of uh, chaos and disorder. So um, that's why uh, the jackal is very much shunned by Dogon society. And a lot of African societies really hate jackals for reasons we can talk about later. Um, but yeah, so that is kind of um, the first attempt uh, of Ama creating life. Uh, eventually, though, he does get it correct and he, he fertilizes the earth uh, and that produces um, a kind of a, a group of twins called the Nomo. Uh, nomos is the, uh, the Dogon word for to make someone drink. Um, and the Nomo are kind of described as um, amphibious, um, fish esque mer, mer people, I guess, for lack of a better term. Uh, there are some depictions where they say they're like their lower half is kind of green and scaly, like a fish or maybe a snake, uh, and then their upper half is more humanoid. Um, but because their lower half is non-human, they are also, like Ama, uh, fairly um, uh, hermaphroditic. Uh, or they can be one sex or the other, uh, or what have you. Uh, now, depending on the version of the story being told, uh, Nomo may have been one person that then uh, split into four pairs of twins, or it had, may have been a pair of twins that then doubled themselves to become, um, yeah, essentially like creating another group of twins from from their union. Um, but anyway, that's again that's one of the regional variations, or depending on the tribe telling the story, they have um, they have a different kind of uh, concept of. Um, the genesis of their people. And Bonomo are the ancestors of um, of the Dogon people. Um, and Lebe, uh, the Dogon ancestor, who was, excuse me, key to the, um, uh, the founding of the Dogon people, he is one of their descendants. Now, I couldn't find a firm story on if he was a, um, you know, if he was a part of the... Um, or if he was a direct descendant of the Nomo twins, or if he came along much later. I couldn't get a firm answer on that, uh, so I, I don't know. Uh, I don't think it matters to the Dogon, or, you know, the point is, uh, Lebe is a descendant of the first uh, peoples. Now, the, um, now the, uh, the Nomo 
one of the Monomo at least uh, it rebels eventually against Ama and his creations. So to kind of restore cosmic order, Ama has to sacrifice um, more of the Nomo. Uh, and uh, de- again, depending on when the story is told and by whom, um, the Nomo uh, that was sacrificed, or it may have been two Nomo sacrificed to restore order, um, they um, uh, created uh, water reservoirs and rivers and things like that to help sustain people. Uh, some of the Nomo may have had their bodies uh, divided so that it would uh, feed men and allow them to drink. Um, so um, the Nomo are, as you might guess, kind of river spirits or deities uh, to an extent. They're not meant to be a specific river, but uh, their uh, their blood and their essence is what gives uh, humans or what allows food and water uh, to be produced uh, for humans to consume. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, sorry, I was listening to a motorcycle just blare down the road here. Um, uh, now, there are also places where uh, the Dogon in their current territory believe uh, that parts of the Nomo uh, uh, bodies uh, landed uh, w- during the sacrificial act, and they build shrines there uh, to kind of uh, worship at. Uh, so, uh, Nomo, very important. Uh, probably more important to the day-to-day life of the Dogon uh, than the Ama, though, of course... Uh, probably none of these uh, deities are probably as important as uh, their later uh, ancestor, uh, direct ancestor, Lebe. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, I think that's a good place to kind of call it. I'm glad we got to cover at least in general some uh, mythology again. Um, I would like to go into a little bit more detail on that, but as I said, Ama is uh, kind of an older deity, and I would like to cover it, but um, I kind of want to get to a point where we can firmly establish uh, identities for certain people. It's only because the Dogon themselves are... There is just one Dogon group. There is not, um, or there's only not one Dogon group. Again, there's dozens of them, uh, or a dozen or so of them. Um, but they all have the same language. Whereas um, the the Monde people or the Monde language is broken up into um, a little bit more uh, distinct ethnic groups. Um, they might understand each other to an extent, but they all have their own uh, traditions that are different from each other. Whereas the Dogon more or less have a uh, very monolithic uh, religious tradition, so um, I would like to talk a little bit more about it, but uh, I kind of want to get till we have uh, firm evidence of a specific ethnic or tribal group before I dive too heavily into their mythology, Um, just to kind of keep things uh, balanced and even. Uh, but we will, I'm sure, return to Ama with some more people later and go into a little bit more detail on some other um, West African religions uh, at a later time. Um, uh, I do need to also refer to the um, the Cordofanian languages. Um, these are probably the less... Um, the less or the, the ones that are most doubted in terms of um, Niger-Congo languages. They're kind of an isolate. Uh, they are much further uh, east than any of the other Niger-Congo languages, and also they're among the more northerly ones as well. Um, they are actually very close to the kind of the Nile River system, uh, and there's a big gap between them and other Niger-Congo-speaking peoples. Um, they are surrounded by Nilo-Saharan speakers, uh, Sudanese speakers, and um, Afro-Asiatic speakers to their north and um, east. Um, 
and because Cordofanian is so kind of doubted, uh, and it's very po- probable that these people may not even be in the area yet, uh, it's hard to kind of get a firm grasp on them. Um, and there are not that many Cordofanian speakers today. I think there's uh, at most maybe half a million. Uh, and that's spread along, oh, f- three or four branches, maybe even five, depending on whose interpretation of the language you take into account, too. Um, and, again, if they exist, their identity, the the proto Cordofanian, um if it exists, isn't enough to talk about, uh, because it may not exist. These could all be just separate languages that uh, form different groups, and they may not even exist until next season anyway, as independent um, branches of the Niger-Congo family. If, again, they are even Niger-Congo, which that's debated. So uh, we'll probably deal with more with these people's uh, next season, maybe even the season after. I'll have to double-check my notes on that, but... um. Yeah. Um, thank you all for listening. I hope you've enjoyed. Uh, I hope you would like the, um, the Dogon creation myth. Um, and I hope that you will look forward to more discussions of Dogon mythology as, uh, as we get to it. Which, again, with the arrival of Islam in the region, we've got quite a ways to go. Uh, but I'm sure we'll talk about the Dogon religion more in the meantime. Or at least about Ama in the meantime. Um, But yeah, uh, please feel free to give me any constructive criticism or feedback at uh, waradrevpod at gmail.com. You can uh, contact me via direct message on X or Twitter, whichever you want to call it. Uh, You can comment on any of the YouTube uploads I make. I upload these episodes audio only on YouTube weekly. Uh, They go up at the same time as Spotify, and I try to include the link um, to the YouTube episode on um, the RSS feed. So whenever it loads up on whatever website, Spotify, um, Apple, uh, wherever you're listening, uh, I think you should have the YouTube link as well. Um, but uh, you can also drop in when I live stream on YouTube, which is uh, usually Monday through Thursday and occasionally some on the weekends. Um, I've been playing as the Inca, uh, in uh, Europa Universalis 4. Um, we're going to try and uh, expand some into Mesoamerica uh, and then hopefully uh, kick out the Europeans uh, from South America to get uh, the achievements uh, for that. Um, making very good progress so far and it's been a very fun run. So uh, I hope to see some of you there, if not all of you. And um, yeah, please. Uh, feel free to contact me. Uh, and uh, please subscribe, like, all that kind of good stuff wherever you can, whenever you can. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you all. I'll see you all next time. You all have a good day and a good week. Peace. <laughs>